Hi, I'm Ronnie Levy, one of the volunteers from the Port Jefferson documentary series. I hope you found Belly of the Beast as thought-provoking and eye-opening as I did. Thank you for joining us for the Q&A with the talented and insightful director, Erica Cohn, moderated by Tom Needham, host of WUSB's Sounds of Films. Enjoy. Thank you, Ronnie, and uh, thank you, Erica. So Erica, uh, I, I'm sure our audience would love to know how you came up with the idea to make this film in the first place. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you all for having me tonight. I wish I could be with you in person. I love this film series and I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you digitally about, uh, about uh, Belly the Beast and, and how it all came to be. So Cynthia Chandler, uh, the attorney and one of the protagonists in the film, and I were first introduced in 2010 through a mutual friend. And I was really inspired by her compassionate release work. She was one of the first attorneys, she was the first attorney in California to get someone out of prison under compassionate release. And she had co-founded Justice Now, which was one of the only organizations, if not the only organization in the country at the time that had board members who are currently incarcerated, kind of informing strategy and informing policy from the inside out. And they had a campaign called the Let Our Families Have a Future campaign, which essentially exposed the multiple ways that prisons destroy the basic fundamental human right to family. Of course, one of the most heinous being the illegal sterilizations, primarily targeting women of color, which really screamed eugenics to me. And as a Jewish woman growing up in Salt Lake City, the phrase never again was always profoundly in the back of my mind. And when I learned about this different kind of genocide that was happening through imprisonment, that was happening through forced sterilization behind bars, I knew that I immediately wanted to get involved. And in the beginning, that was as a volunteer. And I later became a volunteer legal advocate providing direct service needs for over 150 people in California's women's prisons. And from there, I began collaborating with people on a project that ultimately would become Belly of the Beast. And I have to say, Tom, you know, in the beginning of the film, I thought that this was going to be a project that chronicled the incredibly human rights documentation work that was happening on the inside and the kind of underground network that was in practice of getting these human rights abuses out of the prison for people to hear about this, for people to know about what was going on. But it wasn't until I met Kelly Dillon in 2012, a couple years into the process, that that whole trajectory changed. You know, Kelly is this unbelievable activist who was at the time working in Los Angeles as a community interventionist doing gang intervention and domestic violence prevention work. And she had already gone through so much with the sterilization trial through advocating for others. And at that point in her life, she wanted to really set that trauma behind her and focus on her career. And initially she became involved into the, in the project as an advisor behind the scenes. And then later, once the Center for Investigative Reporting released their findings, the movement called for her to get sucked back in to once again testify and advocate on behalf of others um, through a series of hearings and uh, with the goal of ultimately seeking justice for herself and others. And that was the moment that Kelly and I both decided that we would start filming her. And as the film continued, the, uh, the storyline really became centered around her, her story and her relationship with attorney Cynthia Chandler. And I think it's important to note that, you know, Kelly's discovery, her courage really sparked the investigation that exposed the degree of human rights abuses and who was being targeted by the illegal sterilizations. And she says in the film that, you know, the light bulb went off when she saw, you know, other women of color, other black women um, going through the same thing. So if this, if Kelly Dillon hadn't had the courage to even expose this issue in the beginning. This film wouldn't have been possible. The bill wouldn't have been possible. This, none of this would have come to light. Why is it that um, when you talk about Kelly's work, um, 
you, you call it courageous. Why is it courageous for her just to talk about what happened? And why is this work that all of you are involved in considered like underground? Like, why can't this just be something in the open? I think two, two re re I mean, there's so many reasons, but for me, having spent the past decade examining the human rights abuses, including forced sterilization, both as a volunteer legal advocate and as a filmmaker, I have experienced the tremendous layers of secrecy and privacy that these institutions hide behind, which make it incredibly difficult to uncover abuses of power and state-sponsored violence. I remember requesting, one, in one particular case, medical records on behalf of someone, and it taking two years for me to actually get the proper medical records because I was sent time and time and time again, different dates than I had requested, blank pages having nothing like nothing to do with anything. And for Kelly to one, after discovering what had happened to her, um, this, I mean, the process of her requesting her medical records was, um, was very courageous to begin with. She had to petition and petition and to file complaints against the prison just to get access to medical records that everyone should have access to. And then to find out what had actually happened through Cynthia Chandler re um, requesting her medical records and then deciding to file more complaints against the prison and then to sue the prison to actually file a complaint and go to trial. I mean, she was the first sterilization survivor to do it and, uh, and the only sterilization survivor to do it. And in the process, when other people found out what was happening to them, you know, there's actually a process, it's called um, uh, filing it for filing a complaint against uh, the person who committed that harm or filing a complaint against the prison. It's very, um, it's very bureaucratical. Um, it's, you know, you have to have some kind of legal knowledge to file these complaints. And Kelly actually advised other people on how to do that. She was, she was very much viewed as a, as a jailhouse lawyer. You mentioned that there were lots of other people that this happened to as well. And I, I guess part of the challenge of making a film like this is you, you, you can't tell everyone's story, but you did come up with some creative ways uh, to give voice to them. Tell, tell me how you tackled that. It was, it was important to me and it was very important to Kelly that this film was not just her story and that audiences knew that this wasn't just one person, this wasn't just one prison, this wasn't just one state, that this is a pattern, this is a part of the legacy of forced sterilization in this country. And so we had a very complicated reporting process that was um, kind of uh, occurring simultaneously to the filmmaking process. And um, that took a long time to, to uncover how many sterilizations actually occurred in California and beyond. And our team found that between 1997 and 2013, that oh, uh, nearly 1,400 people were sterilized in California's yeah. women's prisons. And then our team sent um, Freedom of Information Act requests to dozens of states across the country. And we know of at least eight states that this is also occurring in but we don't know to what degree because of those layers of secrecy and privacy and because there really isn't another organization like Justice Now that has fully dedicated themselves to uncovering um, what happened. And so in the stories that you do see in the film or that you hear, you know, so many people are actually talking to us from prison. You hear their voices, but we're not able to see their faces. You know, what was very important to all of us to to really find a way, a visual way to transport audiences into the moments that they're describing, to really help audiences feel the, the discomfort of these vulnerable spaces and also really understand how informed consent is not possible behind these prison walls. And so we created, recreated these environments um, actually shot uh, a series of recreations in, in Utah through the Utah Tax Incentive Program um, in a simulate medical simulation center in a dilapidated jail that we completely recreated um, to look and feel the same way that the California prisons did and uh, and then also in a working a working jail and 
that process was so carefully advised by people inside that it was, you know, we agonized over every little tiny detail, you know, from shoelaces to, you know, the evoking the emotions that each individual described and going through that. So when you see the legs dangling from the exam room table, you know, those vulnerable moments, those vulnerable spaces or being handcuffed to the gurney and being wheeled into the surgical room, those were those were moments that were so carefully and um, and deep in such great detail described to to our our team. You mentioned earlier that um, we do have a history of sterilization in the country, and, and that is mentioned in the movie. Well, why was it so important for you to give that background for audiences in two thousand and twenty? And what would you say is um, the the important thing that you've learned about like what's going on now versus what was going on then? Yeah, I didn't know when I started this film 10 years ago that Nazi Germany actually came to the United States to learn from our eugenics policies, specifically our sterilization policies and, and took those back. Um, and that was, was a real, that was a real moment for me. You know, when we think of eugenics, we think of the Holocaust, but we don't talk about this history. We don't talk about the history of women of color being sterilized throughout, throughout our country's history. We don't talk about our heinous eugenics past when over 30 states in the country passed eugenics laws, um, which allowed for compulsory sterilization, um, targeting people who were poor, people who were pregnant, people who um, or became pregnant out of wedlock, people with disabilities, people in prison, people of color. And of course, we know that women of color were the most impacted. And even after most of those, those laws were repealed in the 1970s and the 1980s, we find that these compulsory sterilizations find their way through other policies. I think it's important to note that we're also coming up on the 100 year anniversary of the 1927 Supreme Court case, Buck v. Bell, which upheld a statute essentially um, instituting compulsory sterilization of those who were deemed, quote, unfit. Um, and that, uh, that uh, um, 1927 Supreme Court case has never been overturned. And in the context of what we're seeing and what we're experiencing right now in this moment, you know, after the the sterilizations in ICE detention centers, um, you know, were revealed in September just a couple of months ago, people were shocked. People were horrified. How could this be happening today? And it's because we don't talk about the legacy of forced sterilization in the United States and how it's so deeply rooted in white supremacy. And when we start to confront that, not only from an educational perspective, not only with an apology and atoning for that history, but also to, with accountability, you know, that's when we can start to really prevent these abuses from happening. We actually have a petition on our website, bellyofthebeastfilm.com, um, that is calling for reparations for forced sterilization survivors in California. And you see in the end of the film, Kelly and Cynthia are advocating for these, um, for the reparations movement. And I believe that this will not only continue to make amends for the historical sterilizations, actually following in the footsteps of both North Carolina and Virginia, the first two states to pass reparations for sterilization survivors uh, historically. Um, and I think it's important to note that that was also a bipartisan effort. Um, but to also ensure accountability for modern day instances of forced sterilization, like what happened in California's women's prisons and like what we've just seen in the ICE detention center in Georgia. I think most people get it, but just for clarification, in your opinion, based on your research, why were people doing this in the prison system today? Like what's their philosophy? There's a couple of ways that I think that is that's really important to understand this one taking a step back and looking at imprisonment itself as a form of eugenics imprisonment itself destroys the basic fundamental human right to family women of color are the fastest growing prison population when you are locked up with increasingly long sentences you are therefore unable to have a family families are torn apart 
um, when you are locked up throughout your reproductive capacity years, you're not able to have a family. Um, you know, in, in recent news, we, we saw the Kenosha Sheriff actually calling for imprisonment as a, for, as a way to prevent people from reproducing. I mean, it's very clear what our criminal justice system is doing through imprisonment. And then you take it one step further in um, denying people the right to have a family post-incarceration by taking away the fundamental human right to be able to have a family through sterilization. And you look at who was primarily targeted with the sterilizations, and these were people with um, repeat offenses or um, people, people of color. And um, you see in the end of the film, you know, the nurse kind of echo um, what we've heard throughout the film too, is this is a cost benefit to the state. And that really goes back to the legacy of forced sterilization, the legacy of eugenics in, in the United States. And I also think it's really important to note that while it's easy for us to want to have one bad actor, one bad apple, that it's important to look at this in the context of the entire system and ensure that there is accountability not only for the individuals who committed these harms, but the institutions and where they occurred. I agree. You know, I, I know this is probably not your view, but um, in, I think in the past year or so, um, Planned Parenthood has distanced themselves from their past with uh, Margaret Sanger, who was involved in the early eugenics movement. And it's been one of these things that's been brought up through the years. Uh, some people agree with this, some people don't. But it's, it's kind of reaching the mainstream now. I don't know if you heard, like Kanye West was running for president. Um, not too many people knew that, but, but he was talking about uh, abortion as being something uh, that Margaret Sanger promoted in minority neighborhoods and she was connected to the early eugenics movement. I'm not saying that I agree with any of this, but I was wondering just in, in terms of your research and, and, and what you hear other people saying, um, what this is all about. I mean, Planned Parenthood has distanced themselves now from, from their past. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, I guess they felt there was something negative there, but do you have any thoughts on that? We actually had a panel with Planned Parenthood a, a few weeks ago and Planned Parenthood um, apologized for their eugenics history and, and the connection with Margaret Sanger. And I think in this moment, all institutions, all organizations, all individuals need to examine how they have been complicit um, in systemic racism, in institutionalized racism. And I was uh, very, very happy to hear that Planned Parenthood was, was acknowledging um, that history and atoning for it and moving, moving beyond it. And I think in terms of the, in terms of, you know, the conversation about um, bodily autonomy and a woman's right to choose, it's very important that we include that this, this encompasses someone's right to choose whether or not, or when to have a family. It's, it's both. Sure. Um, your film takes place in uh, mostly California, and um, it's a heavily democratic state. Um, I don't know much about the politics there, but obviously we, we have a possible vice president elected um, from California. Um, was Kamala Harris around um, at that time when all this stuff was going on in the prison system? Yeah, it's a really interesting conversation. I mean, she, she was definitely um, a part of, of the conversation when it was happening, when the hearings were happening and um, conversations surrounding what, you know, how do we, how do we address um, uh, uh, this potential bill and moving forward after the bill passed. Um, you know, I think taking it in even a step further um, and bringing it back to the conversation about reparations, California has apologized for their, for their history. In 2003, the governor actually apologized for the eugenics history, and yet it was still going on. So even though people support the idea that this is something that should be banned, it should be never, you know, uh, there should be additional laws, uh, put in place a sunshine statute to highlight the already present illegality of these procedures, we need to do more. We need to ensure that there's accountability and I hope that she'll be a part of that. Yeah, I'm so impressed with this movie. Uh, it's such a difficult topic and as you said, people just don't want to talk, but you got people to talk and that's impressive. Um, what is your strategy 
uh, for getting people to come forward. They're courageous. You're proper in giving them credit for that, but you're doing something on your end too. What is it? <laughs> Behind the scenes. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I mean, there, there's um, a definite reason why this film took 10 years. And it was actually, I think it's um, one of the interesting stories. We're at the end of 2018. We thought this film was ready to be birthed into the world. We were so excited to release it. And two essential components of the film happened at the very last minute. The two nurses who speak in the film, I had been trying to find uh, nurses, former nurses who worked in, in the California prison system to speak about what happened. And that took a long time to one, find people who would be willing to talk and, um, and to talk through the process because we, we think of prisons as retaliatory environments, but we don't actually think about that in terms of who works there. And there was a lot of fear, a lot of concern about what would happen if people would lose their pensions, um, if, if they spoke out about the abuses that were happening. So that is, I think, just one, one story that's indicative of all the stories in the film. It took a long time to, to build trust um, and to ensure that this film was made with the same care and compassion uh, that needed to happen in telling these very traumatic stories. Um, Kelly, in particular, you know, when she decided to, to transition from being an advisor behind the scenes to being in front, of the, in front of the camera, that was a process that she guided us through. That was a process that she, when she was ready to talk about certain things, led us through that. That was not a process that was like, we're, you know, we have a month here, let's, let's, let's get this film done. This film was handled with such tremendous care um, and obviously simultaneously the, the reporting process took a very, very long time as well. Um, so I think um, having the patience and, um, and knowing that this film would be made at all costs, well, however long it took, that it would be ready when it was ready. I love filmmakers like you who make films about difficult subjects. Uh, it's not always easy because uh, in the commercial market, uh, that can be a challenge. Uh, what, it, what has been your experience with this movie? Um, are, are there doors opening or closing for you in terms of being able to show this film on streaming channels and all the places that you might want to show it? What has been your experience? You know, it's, I think it's still too early to tell. Um, we actually, you know, plan to release the film this year and actually had our broadcast on Independent Lens scheduled for next year. And instead of waiting for a distributor to release the film theatrically or potentially decide to hold it to release it uh, theatrically in the you know sometime next year we decided to reimagine our distribution strategy amid the pandemic this is actually before we even found out that the that the ice sterilizations had happened but you know amid the movement for black lives amid this moment where we are really talking about and just and like viscerally experiencing systemic racism and population control through policing, imprisonment, the immigration detention system, through lack of access to healthcare during the pandemic, this film had to be accessible in this moment. And so we decided to do a, a DIY theatrical. We decided to move up our, our broadcast on Independent Lens, which will be on November 23rd. It was essential for us to have this, uh, this film in this moment. You've said several times in our discussion that there's a whole bunch of other issues that I think maybe um, people maybe not as involved in what you're, you're doing um, may not quite understand. You, you're, you seem to include things like housing and policing and, and, and other things in society as also being uh, similar to sterilization. Can you expand on that just a little bit more? Absolutely. What do you mean by that? Absolutely. So in this moment, we're really witnessing systemic racism and population control through who has access to health care. When you look at who is being most impacted by the pandemic, it's people of color. When you look at the immigration detention system and how immigra the immigration detention system destroys the basic fundamental human right to family, and even furthermore with the news of, of the mass hysterectomies that are occurring um, in detention systems, that is another form of, of eugenics, that is another form of genocide. When you look at who is, who is policed, uh, the, who, what populations are imprisoned and the length of sentences they receive, it's very clear that this is all a part 
of what we like to call modern day eugenics. Now, it's clear when you see something like the sterilization program going on in prisons or the way that it used to be in earlier decades, it's by design. Do you think these other things that you refer to are also being done intentionally by design or is it just, um, are these just the side effects of living in the type of uh, society that we live in? I definitely think it's by design. It's definitely by design. And you can replace one institution with another institution with another institution. And across, across the board, you're seeing how this is, there are policies that are very intentionally targeting people of color um, and uh, you know, describe in different tactics, but ultimately describe modern day eugenics. Okay. What has been the best thing to come out of this filmmaking experience for you in terms of, um, I, I'm sure a number of people have seen the movie now and I'm sure some things have happened as a result of them seeing this film. I think the best thing that has come out of audience reactions is what we ultimately hoped. What can people do? You know, we wanted to leave audiences being inspired, but also being angry. You know, anger is an action-oriented emotion and inspiration is also an action-oriented feeling. So, you know, in thinking about the end of the film, I actually want to take a step back and talk a little bit about how we came to the ending of the film. And we always knew that we wanted to have someone be the musical voice of the film. And when we asked people inside, if you could have one artist who could be the musical voice of Belly the Beast, who would it be? And everyone said, hands down, Mary J. Blige. So typically, you know, a <laughs> film would be, would be done prior to going out and uh, reaching out to very high profile artists. And we actually didn't have an ending to the film yet. We were trying to figure out the best, the best possible way to leave audiences. We knew we wanted them to be inspired and to be moved to action, but you know, how were we going to do that? So we actually, once Mary J. Blige signed onto the film, um, and thanks to our incredible music supervisor, Tracy McKnight, um, able to establish this in incredible collaboration with her and DJ Camper and Nova Wave, we started talking about how we would create a scene and a song that left audiences with this feeling that the work was still yet to be done, that these wounds will never heal, but that their justice needs to happen. And we have the power to actually bring justice to the survivors. And so, as you see in the end of the film, Kelly and Cynthia are continuing the work through the reparations movement. And you hear Mary J's incredible voice talking about this very thing. And I think that that collaboration was just as, as good as it possibly could be. <clears throat> as good as it yeah. possibly could be. I love that. I, I really enjoyed that part. Um, if there's people watching now who want to somehow help, what, what can people do? I would encourage everyone who has seen this film, who's watching this Q&A, to sign the petition on our website, bellyofthebeastfilm.com. That'll help ensure that survivors of forced sterilization um, receive reparations. And also a part of that reparations bill includes notifying forced sterilization survivors that still to this day don't know. I think that's a really important point that not everyone like Kelly actually knows what happened to them. And so part of this is creating a task force to notify people that they were in fact sterilized as well as creating some sort of memorial about our eugenics history, about the recent sterilization abuse, so that it will be a constant reminder, may this never happen again. In addition, I just encourage everyone to get involved at, at a local level or community level on what's going on. You know, I think we can all take actions. We all have the power to create change. And you see that with Kelly and Cynthia, unlikely allies who come together to, to tackle. I mean, the Department of Corrections is no small feat. We can actually, you know, address smaller things in our community. And I hope this film is, is a tale of inspiration for us all to get more involved. I agree. And um, I have to ask you, um, all filmmakers are always thinking about their next project. Um, what's the next thing that you would like to tackle in terms of subject matter? 
I have a couple projects that I'm not able to yet speak about, but I look forward to releasing one in early, uh, early 2021. I guess we're now looking at 2021. Um, and uh, look forward to keeping everyone updated about, about what's next. Hopefully the next film will be here too. <laughs> Well, I hope so, too. Uh, Erica, I want to congratulate you again on this film. Uh, it's such an important film. Um, it's amazing that it's still going on. And it, it's, it's in some ways inspiring. In some ways, it's a little um, disappointing. It makes it seem like, you know, it, it's, it's never going to end. But, um, but you do give us hope and the people in the film do. And um, thank you for the work that, that you do, you know. Um, it's a, it's a great movie. So we're going to send it back to the, everyone at Port Jeff, Jefferson Documentary Film Series, and uh, we'll look forward to your next movie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erica and Tom, for this informative and disturbing Q&A about the timely and important documentary, Belly of the Beast. If the viewers have any further questions, please email them to us at Port Jefferson Documentary Series, and we'll forward them to Erica. And we also hope Many of you will plan to join us for the spring 2021 documentary series.